Man, that was weak. Come on, come on. Give it a, give it a, hey, amen. All right. Amen. Good morning, good morning. Welcome. Glad to have you with us today to come and worship our King. Amen. amen. So much stuff going through this head right now. I'm thinking the word, oh, we were singing that song, holy. And I've said this before, but I, I just can't help to remind it, be reminded. You can't say holy without it coming from down here. You just try it. You can't. You can't. It, God wants holy. It starts down in here, right? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And those words, there's a reason. Those words, they come, they come deep. Yeah, just, you know, you can do what you want with that, but that's had to remind me. As we were singing, thinking about that. I, I just, Gunnar reminded me of just, uh, as he was talking and, and leading us in prayer for giving, uh, thanking those. I want to thank those who give in serving, you know, with the children and other areas. You know, a lot of times people uh, will fall away. They maybe get saved as a child or a teenager or whatever, and they kind of fall away, and then they start having kids. And they say, you know, we want our kids around other good kids or what it like they're at church, but let's pretend they are. Uh, but, but, you know, and they'll come back to church. And you know what? That's why it's important that we have a great preschool and great children's ministry and teen ministry and all that. So I want to thank you for giving and serving and being a part of that. We need you. If right now, in fact, I want you to pray about that. Pray about that. God, would you have me serve in children's or other ministry. And then you can ask, you know, our leaders, hey, do we have room? Do we need anybody right now? And just see where that's at, see where the two meet. And, and I also want to thank you this morning, just the way, and I shouldn't thank you because you're doing what God's told you to do, but I want you to always pray about your giving. God, how would you have me give? We, we challenged you a few weeks ago about uh, blessing our new mission in Cantonment and then you did that. We asked you in the Lottie Moon, the, the International Mission Board offering. I hope that you prayed, God, God, what would you have me give? And you gave that today. But I want you to just pray about that in general. God's put me, he gave a story I read months ago. And I'm always hesitant to say that, but I just got to share the story. There's a, a guy went to his pastor and said, Pastor, I feel God put it on my heart. I want to write this check for $25,000. He gave the church $25,000. That was great. That was great. By the way, we have had that happen before. You know, awesome when that happens. But the same man was in the news the next week. He gave $5 million to the college. Hey, that's great. That's great. But I just want you to know, per adventure, the Lord tells you, we have plans. There are things that we would do. All right? We've been, we have been ministering out of a shoebox for years. I'm comfortable there. We can do that. And daddy don't need a Learjet, I'm telling you. It ain't about that. <laughs> but I'm just saying, per adventure, God put that on your heart. I just heard you don't get what you, if you don't ask. So I'm thinking, you know, they don't know. They don't know. There's things that we would do around here and other missions because we are going, right? We're going. We're places. Speaking of that, we had, we had some ladies yesterday, and they were just, they, they, they went to a place of business saying that they're going to, you know, we're, we're just going to, we want to share Jesus. How's the way we can do it? And they came up with this idea of, the, of just free gift wrapping. You know, people are buying stuff for Christmas. We'll do free gift wrapping, you know, and, and so they did that, and they had the opportunity to pray with people and share. And I know that's just one thing. Many of you are doing those kind of things. I want to say, thanks for being obedient. Amen? Thank you for doing that. You should do that. So, I just want to get, we're just, we've been, and Merry Christmas, because I know some of you are going to be going away for Christmas. You're going to see family and friends elsewhere, and we will, we're going to love on your people. Some of you got people that are going to be coming in, and we look for, forward to seeing them. Friday, uh, Saturday at 5 p.m., no child care that night, I don't think. No, it's no, no, it's not. And then Saturday more, uh, Sunday morning will be our regular times, just so you know. If you're looking up, it's our regular times, and we will have child care. Because many of you signed up last week and said, hey, we'll be there. We'll help out. We will make sure we're not shorthanded. All right? If y'all got all that, just say, right, right. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're desperate this morning to hear a word from you. And sometimes people are in here, they don't even know they're desperate yet. God, I pray that you would put... 
the import of what's being said this morning from your word to the heart, that you would cut to that heart, Lord. Just as we sing hallelujah and holy, it comes from the depths of our heart, Lord. I pray that you would speak a word this morning that gets down there, Lord. And I pray that we'd be motivated to do what you call us to do, Lord. I can only be me. And I pray that people in here, they will try to only be themselves in you, in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, well, we continue our series, The Journey and the Miracle, The Miracle and the Birth, this morning. Last week, we talked about the journey for Mary and Joseph, the young couple tasked with the privilege and honor of bringing the Son of God into the world and raising him. What a responsibility that was. We started with the surprising good news and everything that transpired to the, to the birth and the, the first visitors of the baby. We tried to paint a picture to where we could empathize with what they were experiencing and, and there's no way that we can really do that, you know, going back in time and thinking about that. It's not our culture and we've, it's just time has passed. In this message, we want to paint a second picture. Uh, this one surrounds the miraculous circumstances of the birth of Jesus, dealing with the when, where, who, and the how. The Savior of the world was born into the humble setting of the manger in Bethlehem. We know that story, I'm, and I hope that we can at least get a glimpse of the awe-inspiring atmosphere and the divine significance of that event. You know, we do some things. We, you know, how many of y'all have taken the family out and you went and looked at the lights in your neighborhoods? Anybody done any of that yet? Or maybe a family comes in. You will do that then, you know. Uh, um, and it is, you know, it is, it is something, right? It is a little, ah, a little something, something in there, you know, when you go out there and you see the lights. And, uh, and, and I appreciate those people that do that because I'm not that person. But I, I appreciate the lights. I do appreciate what you do. It's beautiful. And, and then, you know, it seems like you got to have a cup of hot chocolate or something. Just, just a little something in there, right? Isn't it? Y'all feel it? This time of year, it's just a little, it's just, a, it, what is it? Well, you know, you can't put your finger on, but there's just something. And then, especially if you're around the kids and the children and all that, there's just a little something extra in it. But as we, as we delve into it, I want us to consider which is the greatest which is the greater miracle? How it happened, that is the birth of Christ. That it was prophesied of hundreds and even thousands of years before it happened. Or God's love exhibited for a desperate and undeserving people. I mean, that God would love somebody like me. We're going to look at some key verses that capture the essence of the miraculous nature of Jesus' birth, emphasizing the divine intervention through the conception by the Holy Spirit and the fulfillment of the prophecy regarding the birth of the Messiah. These verses underscore the significance of Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior of humanity, highlighting the central message of hope and redemption found only in the Christian faith. I want you to think. Any other faith or religion is about a whole lot of works and box checking. Ten of these, seven of those, five of these, whatever. Christianity is about the relationship. The relationship with the one we, we sing to. I, I hope you're singing to him when you sing. And maybe that'll change how you sing. You're singing to him, not about him. But Christianity is about the relationship. And for that to happen, for this relationship to happen between us and God, God had to become relatable. So let's start with how that happened. In Luke 1, 26 through 33, we read that Mary is told that it's going to happen. She's going to conceive and bear a son who will be called the son of the most high and he will reign on the throne of David forever and will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
to be clear, his kingdom will never end. The baby that Mary is about to give birth to, he's kind of a big deal. Verse 26, we read, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph uh, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called Son of Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. All of that naturally leads to Mary asking a logical question. Verse 34, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Just picture sweet, innocent, teenage Mary. And if you need to picture somebody, Dorothy for the Wizard of Oz, you know, I, I hear you, Mr. Angel, but I haven't been with anyone. How is this happening? In verse 35, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is a sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So, to answer the question, it will be a miracle. You see, God is not using natural means. That's why it doesn't make sense. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. That's why the child will be called Holy, the Son of God. This is not going to be the son of any man. He will be the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. Oh, this goes way back. So this is not Joseph's biological son. N knowing that this was quite a bit to fathom for anyone, much less a teenager, God tells her about her cousin Elizabeth's situation. Not quite miraculous, but certainly an attention getter. See, Elizabeth, her cousin, was considered barren. She was past her prime. She was too old to have children. And yet she would. That would get somebody's attention. And not just any child, but the one that would be the forerunner of Christ. So as we read last week, Mary would go to see her cousin Elizabeth and have it, she'd have at least one relative, praise the Lord, at least one relative that understood her situation and that she wasn't just telling a fairy tale. This Elizabeth knew the truth of what was happening inside of Mary. If you remember the story, uh, her baby, John the Baptist, six months in there, he does a somersault, hearing about, you know, just seeing Mary comes because he knows what's going on. The Spirit knows all that's going on. So God gave Mary at least one person that she could talk to. Aren't you glad you got somebody? Sometimes you just got one person you can talk to and they'll believe whatever you say. <laughs> So the pregnancy of Mary was miraculous. And I think we would consider talking with an angel somewhat in the miraculous category. Would you agree? That's kind of different. And then somehow she had to get the man that she was engaged to, Joseph, to not misread the situation or assume natural relations had taken place. Joseph was going to take some convincing Somebody's going to have to do some explaining to Joseph. You know what I'm saying? 
And I don't think there was any man or woman on earth that would be an adequate representative. There wasn't anybody else he was going to believe on this story. So God knew that. So another miracle was in order. And that's why I'm calling miracle. A miracle means signs, same thing. A miracle, signs that Jesus, when he did some healing, it was a sign of who he was. And once Joseph found out Mary was pregnant, well, he, he knew this was not his child, so he was going to prepare to divorce her privately and not shame her. And that was his plan until God sent this messenger to let him know in on the miracle, miracle pregnancy. So we read from Matthew's account in Matthew 1, 20 and 21, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And Joseph was told not to take, not to fear taking Mary as his wife. Fear what? Fear what people would say. Fear what people would think. I mean, come on. Everybody talking about them in the neighborhood. Y'all know that. Fear being, a ba- fear being a baby daddy. That responsibility. Or fear being the stepdaddy of the son of God. And I, they kind of raise them stakes are coming up a little bit. I I don't know, but there's plenty there, but I I think the latter for me would be the scariest thing. Joseph would have the responsibility of raising God's son. (laughs) Anybody want that? So which is the greater miracle? How it happened? Or next, that it was prophesied. We briefly alluded to one key verse in scripture earlier and this verse or scene took place in the Garden of Eden shortly, shortly after man's sin. That was Genesis 3.15 uh, where God says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, he was speaking to the serpent, and, and between your offspring and her offspring or your seed and her seed, he, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. More than 2,000 years before Jesus was in the womb of Mary, God promised that the seed or offspring of the woman would crush the head of Satan. This is prophesied. God tells it before it happens. It's the proto evangelium, it's the first good news. And that is what this verse is about. Certainly, Satan. The serpent in Genesis and the great dragon in Revelation would bruise the heel of God's son, the seed of the woman at the cross, but the son would crush his head. It's all good. But that is not the only reference of the one to come. Prophecy of the virgin birth was announced over 500 years before it happened, Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel. We know this passage speaks of Jesus because it says he will be known as Emmanuel, meaning God with us. I mean, what kind of, what do you need? <laughs> you need a sign? Hey, how about we name him God with us because he's God with us. This was true of Jesus, in fact, not only as a title, Emmanuel speaks of both the deity of Jesus, don't miss this, it speaks of both of the deity of Jesus, God, and his identification and nearness to man with us. God with us. So how is Christ God with us? In Genesis, God became a man. In, in John 1, excuse me, I said, did I say Genesis? In Jesus, God became a man. I'm thinking about Genesis. In Jesus, God became a man. And in John 1, we read in John, early John. He t- see, John, see, 
Matthew and Luke tell you about the birth, but John wants you to know he's the Jesus' the son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He says, that, he goes on to say, there's nothing that was made that was not made by him. Jesus is God. He's not just a prophet, not just a teacher, not just a good man, and a lot of religions in the world will say those things about him, but they deny his deity, and so they're wrong. Jesus is God. John 1, 14 tells us that he came and dwelt among us. He became flesh. He put on flesh. He came and tabernacled among us. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is God with us by the influence of his Holy Spirit and the preaching of his word. He's God with us in our private prayer. Uh, and he's God with us in our private working in our lives. He is immersed in our lives to comfort, to enlighten, to protect and defend us in every time of temptation and trial. He is there. In the hour of death, who are we talking to? He is there. In the day of judgment, he'll be there. And God with us and in us and we with him and to all eternity if he is in us. He relates to us. When, Christian, when you are in trouble, who do you go to? You don't always go to him first, do you? But you go to him when it's really bad. We should go to him first. He is with us. The only thing I got going for me is that I'm in Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ that God will see in me to let me in those pearly gates. Not good things that I've done. He's going to see me clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Amen? Now, where he, was, where he would be born was pre-announced as well as hundreds of years before. Micah 5, 2, we read that probably last week. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And we spent last week explaining how that was miraculous and also how the people of the day could have simply gone down to the tax office and verified that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed born in Bethlehem where the Savior was to be from. Never mind that the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. The Jews were to be a light of the Gentiles. But where they fell short, the one from whom the lineage from the ancient of days, would indeed be the light of the world. You see, the Jews were to be the light of the world. They were to be a light to the Gentiles. They failed. Jesus comes to be the light of the world. Of course, there's the detailed character of the child to come. In, in Isaiah 9, 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Oh, what a wonderful and clear description. He was the prescription the world needed. You see, we are in a sin-sick world, and it's killing us. Jesus is the prescription needed for the world. The child is born. The son is given. These words were very intentional. The wonderful prophecy of the birth of the Messiah serves as a reminder to Israel that the conquering Messiah would be a man in theory, the Messiah could have been an angel or maybe God with no humanity, in theory. But neither of those options were truly viable because they would have not qualified the Messiah to be our Savior and High Priest as Jesus is. The child had to be born. God comes down to earth. 
He gets earthy. He, he gets dirty, so to speak, if you will. And, and as a child, a child is so vulnerable in this world, weak, helpless, and dependent. Who was going to be looking out for him? This man, the carpenter? Certainly, God could have sent the Messiah as a grown man. Adam was. However, if Jesus was to fully identify with mankind and to be able to legitimately reveal the servant nature of the Godhead, he would have to do just what he did. Make himself of no reputation, take on the form of a servant, come in the likeness of man, as Paul wrote in Philippians 2.7. But this child would be more than just a man. He is also the forever eternal son of God. The ancient of days, the word. He was there in Genesis chapter 1. He was part of the lettuce. Let us make man in our image. He is the second part of the trinity. And once again, in theory, the Messiah did not have to be God. He could have been a sinless angel or a perfect version of Adam. But in reality, neither of those options would have qualified the Messiah to be our Savior and high priest as Jesus is. It's written in uh, Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. I want you to hear this. But we have one in Jesus who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Pause button. You think of the ways you're tempted. I hate to make you think that way right now. Just, it says in the Bible that Jesus was tempted in every way. You say, well, yeah, well, my sin's not that bad. But that guy over there, that, what they do? Guess what? It says that he was tempted just as he was tempted. Hmm? I'll back up for for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet without sin. You see, sin's not the temptation. It's only when we, you know, give into it. Jesus never did that. And he came and lived proving that, you, you know, you can go this life without doing that. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You see, this lets me know that when I'm really feeling crappy about me because of who I am, what I've done, maybe whatever. He's saying, you come to me because the one you're coming to knows how you were tempted. He knows you, he knows you blew it. But you come and let's square things back up. I got you. So it may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Do you need that this morning? Go to him. Go to the throne of grace. Tell him what he already knows and ask for help. The son had to be given. The child could be, the child could and had to be born because the humanity of Jesus had a starting point. You see, there was a time when humanity was not added to his deity. The son had to be given because the second person of Trinity is eternal and existed forever as a son. So the son is not born. He was in the beginning of the words with God and the word was God. He he's always has been. The son is given. There's your Christmas gift. The Son of God is given. That is the greatest gift ever. And it's an act of grace. He didn't have to come. Because, and we didn't deserve it. Does anybody in here deserve salvation? I, you like, I know I deserve. Furthermore, we proved what we 
we proved that we did not deserve it in how we treated the son when he came here. We call that Easter. Jesus, the Messiah, is fully God and fully man. That's miraculous. He's 100%. He's not 50-50. To be clear, there was a time when the eternal Son of God added humanity to his deity. He never became less God, but he added a human nature to his divine nature and so became one person with two distinct natures, functioning together in perfect harmony. He is one of a kind. He is the one and only son of God. See John. That Jesus is both God and man tells us that man really is made in the image of God in Genesis 1.26. And that perfect humanity is more compatible with deity than we maybe ever thought. Here's the deal. Our problem is not our humanity, but our depravity. Our problem is not our humanity, but our fallenness. To say that I'm only human is a cop-out, and it's wrong, because Jesus was fully human, yet perfect. It's more accurate to say that I'm only fallen. Uh, fallen. I'm a sinner. I, I messed up, but... But remember that the humanity that Jesus added to his divine nature was the perfect humanity of Adam and Eve before the fall, not the sinful humanity that we're familiar with. Remember, they started out perfect. They had free will. Yes, so did Jesus. The choices that they made, the decisions they made, that he made, that's the difference. And here's another thing I don't think we think about too often. Jesus remains a man eternally. Let me be fair, I, I didn't really think about that till this. Acts 7, 55 to 56. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 1 Timothy 2 5 says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus did not abdicate his humanity on his ascension. He didn't turn in his man card when he went into heaven. He is now a man in a glorified body as we will, own, as we will one day have. He is the God-man. It is miraculous that God will become a man. Amen? Oh. Even more still, that he would remain a man forever. I mean, I'd be like getting out of that skin. I mean, you know, if I'm him, if I'm in his shoes. But this is it, folks. He wants to hang out with us. Get, wrap your mind around that. He wants to hang out with us. He wants to play pickleball with you or whatever the latest thing is. He, I mean, I was just thinking about this. I was thinking, you know, this is the time of year, a lot of basketball games are on, a lot of high school games are going and, and stuff happening. And let me just say, I'm saying, if Jesus is sitting there at the basketball game with you, do you think he's yelling at the ref too? I don't know. <laughs> he's like, he missed that. He missed it. I saw that. I mean, I don't know. I mean, whatever it takes, just, just think. He's not far away. He's not a far away God. He became God with us so that he could come near. If Jesus were not fully man, he, would not, he could not stand as the substitute for sinful man. He, he couldn't stand, our, he couldn't die in our place. He couldn't take the punishment that we deserve if he were not a man. If, if he were not fully God, then his sacrifice would be insufficient. It wouldn't be enough. There's no man good enough for that. If, if Jesus is not fully God and fully man, then we are lost in sin. You know what that means? It means we're hopeless. We got no hope. And that is why Christmas is about hope. It's... It's when God became a man. Christmas is saying, we've got a chance. We have an advocate. We have someone that can really, really do something about our situation. 
And he's the Savior. We're not, but we are ambassadors to tell others about him. He came on our behalf. Why? And more than any prophecy being fulfilled, more than understanding any miracle to me, why did he do it is the big head scratcher. I mean, Jesus doesn't really seem to be genuinely appreciated at Christmas time or Easter. It seems more like, what can I or we get out of him? What are, what are you going to do for me, Jesus? We, we want gifts. We want the best gifts. We want to give gifts that people want. And here in Christ Jesus, the Father has offered to all mankind the greatest gift ever. And many have treated him like that gift, like that gift that they don't want. You know, the one that you give away to some other people next year. I mean, is that rejected and there's the thing, God even knew that beforehand. Isaiah 53, 3 says he was despised and rejected of men. He said that 700 years before he sent him. Behold, a child is born, a son is given. We want the best of both worlds. Let me tell you something this morning. Jesus is the best of both worlds. He brings it all together. Do you notice when he shows up, all of a sudden heaven's coming down here. Angels coming up, showing up like they've been here all, I mean, they, they're just coming and going. Out there in the middle of the field as the shepherds were minding their own business, the angels showed up with great news. Heaven and earth came together that night. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary as heaven and earth came together. God is working the plan. So the question is, what is our response? God's doing his part. He's come, he's gone, he's coming back. There are still some prophecies to be fulfilled, like the government will be upon his shoulders. Ultimately, this will be fulfilled in the millennium when Jesus Christ will rule the earth as king of kings and lord of lords. But you don't have to wait on that to make him your king. You can do that right now. In fact, if you don't make him king right now, if he comes later, he will not be your king. Well, he will be, but you're going to miss out. You're not going to be in part of his kingdom. Of all the miraculous things associated with the birth of our dear Savior, in my humble opinion, the loving kindness expressed through the embodied Christ child is the greatest miracle of all. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And he doesn't stop there. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The free gift of eternal life is through faith in Jesus Christ. Have you made that step yet? Listen, God stepped into our problem when there was no way out and when no one else would or could. You need to get that. Nobody else coming for you and me in our mess, in our messiness. And you know what? Even if they wanted to, nobody else could do what he did. That's a problem. But you know what? The answer to that that's Christmas. So I ask you, what's the greatest miracle? Angels assembling together, the stars lining up, uh, the stars in the universe, all that, the virgin birth, the angels talking to people in visions and dreamings, etc. No, none of that. Because listen, God spoke the whole world in existence. That's, that's little stuff. That's small potatoes. There's nothing that he can't do. So for me, the why is the greatest miracle. His love is indescribable. I can't comprehend it. But God demonstrated his love toward us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, I was thinking about this. God makes us feel like we belong when we don't feel it. I shouldn't be allowed in his kingdom. You ever, you ever been, you know, you just weren't there at the place and people say, hey, come on, we, and they invited you somewhere and you thought you shouldn't be invited and 
they just rolled out the red carpet. God, at Christmas, God is rolling out the red carpet and saying, and we're saying, no, we don't deserve that. Maybe we should come around the side. But you got a back door, God? He's like, no, come on. That's the why that I can't comprehend. Because I don't know about y'all. Y'all look like some really good people. But I'm not. I, you know, I, I don't know why. The loving kindness of God. You want to do something? You got some holiday? You got some days off? Look up the word loving kindness in the Old Testament and do a concordance on it in the Hebrew. And you just try to understand God's loving kindness. You, you, one, loving kindness, by the way, in the Hebrew word, you, 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 you can't describe it with one English word. In fact, it's, it, it's the why. I, 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 don't, I don't know why he did it. But it's why we have Christmas. Because God started giving up gifts to people that didn't deserve gifts when nobody had gifts to give. That's what Christmas is about. Now is your time to respond however God is speaking to you this morning? I'm still scratching my head. I'm thinking maybe the next service I'll understand this, get it. But I think it's okay it's like unwrapping a gift, right? We don't know what it is yet. Yeah. But I do believe this. I believe that God, he's amazing and he's speaking to you about what you need to hear this morning. And it needs to line up the word, right? Don't you come in here and say, I said something I didn't say. It needs to line up with the word of God, all right? Well, maybe he's calling some people back. Maybe he's calling somebody to himself. And today would be the day of salvation for you. And by the way, I want to tell you something. Saturday night, next Sunday, we ain't playing around. God's giving us the word. If you've got some people, you've got family that don't know Jesus, they'll have an opportunity to respond. So we're not just like, you know, call it in. Oh, it's Christmas. It's going to be some night. Oh, oh it's going to be Christmas. I invite you to stand and you respond as God has spoken to you. And if you, hey, you want to come up here and pray, feel free to do that, whatever. You can do that right where you're at. You sure can but you'll be obedient to him.